Hi there. Um, my name is Sam Sitters. This is Tally. Um, I am giving a presentation on the honor code at Williams for incoming first years. So welcome everyone. We're so glad to have you at Williams. Um, and I can't wait to see you guys around. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I am the student co-chair of the honor and discipline committee. I am a rising junior. So class of 2025. Um, and I have been on the committee for two years now. Um, and my email is below. So if you have any questions about what I talk about in this presentation, please, please, please reach out to me. Um, I'd love to chat about basically anything. So let's get in. So in this presentation, I will cover just a bigger introduction of myself. Um, I'll talk about the honor code, what that means both, you know, on paper and in practice. I'll talk a little bit about how the wording of the honor code is vague, but uh, I'll talk about all of the things that the honor code encompasses. Um, then I'll talk a, lot, a little bit about the committee itself. Um, I will briefly go through what an honor hearing looks like and possible sanctions that we give out. And then um, I'll talk about the key takeaways for the bulk of this presentation um, and resources available to you guys um, that I really encourage you to take advantage of as students. And then to wrap it up, I'll just briefly talk about running for a position on this great committee. So who am I? I definitely don't want you guys to just think of me as the honor co-chair. First and foremost, I am a Williams student, and I like to think a fun person to be around. Um, my majors are in geosciences and classics, and my concentrations are in maritime studies and environmental studies. Um, I wouldn't recommend majoring and concentrating in this many things, but it just happened. Um, so definitely feel free to talk to me about obviously the honor code but also williams mystic which is the maritime studies program um i did that my sophomore fall um and that's where the selfie was taken we were in southern louisiana and this is a nutria rat which i think is the world's largest rodent maybe that's a capybara not sure anyways it was huge um so i had to take a selfie with it uh, I also love country music, the Minnesota Vikings, rocks, Latin coffee, and being a TA. I get a lot of joy from that. So yeah, feel free to reach out to me about any aspect of William's life, basically. All right, so getting into the honor code specifically, um, what is the honor code? So there's a whole web page on the Dean's website, which is really, really great. I highly recommend giving it a scroll all the way through. Um, there should be a live link attached to this that you guys can... Uh, click on and access that web page. Um, on the website, it states that a student who enrolls at the college thereby agrees to respect and acknowledge the research and ideas of others in his or her, which should be their work, and to abide by those regulations governing work stipulated by the instructor. Um, so I'll get into sort of the vagueness and intricacies of this statement in the next slide, but basically um, the honor code covers um, plagiarism, like citation issues, which are sort of related, um, any sort of unauthorized collaboration, this could be with other people um, or with the internet, and unauthorized use of AI, which is, as you guys know, a relatively new thing that we've had to consider, but um, we've seen it, you know, quite a lot. So unauthorized use of chat GPT or an essay editing software like Grammarly. Um, and then importantly, by following the honor code, you are maintaining fairness among your peers and upholding the academic integrity of the college and the broader academic community. Um, you guys, I'm not sure if you've already done it yet or not, but you'll get um, an email with basically the honor code and you will have to sign that. And that, you know, by signing that, you agree to abide by the honor code for your four years at Williams College. All right. So... The words on the Dean's website that I just read might be, you know, a little vague. They don't get into the specifics about what's covered, the specifics of plagiarism and stuff like that. Um, but that's because the honor code is really meant to be this all encompassing thing. Um, and I actually asked my good friend, um, I was like, I had to give a presentation for the first years. And what is like the one thing you wish you knew about the honor code coming into Williams? And he was like, I think people should know that the honor code can really vary between courses and assignments. And I was like, that is a really good point. So I thought I would make it a slide. Um, so the honor code can in fact vary from course to course and from assignment to assignment. And your professors should discuss what the honor code looks like in their course. Um, and you know, on their syllabus, they should have a specific section for the honor code. 
sometimes just near the back, um, reading syllabi <laughs> after syllabus, after, syllabus after syllabus can get really tedious, but I do really recommend reading through that section for all of your courses um, and maybe highlighting the important parts of that. Um, and it can often within classes shift between um, exams or assignments as well. So this, all of the pictures have some sort of significance in this presentation, I promise. But this is me with my good friend, Nathan, um, in our mineralogy and petrology class. And for our final project, we had to basically do a fancy lab report. Um, and so we had to collect the data for this lab report at the scanning electron microscope, which you don't need to know what that is. Um, <laughs> but we basically went down there, worked with the lab tech, Nancy, and we were allowed to collect our data together. So we helped each other learn how to use this microscope, how to collect data. Um, you know, we were like, oh, you should sample that section. Oh, you should sample that section. So that was really collaborative. But for the actual report, we obviously had to write our own words, use our own data that we collected um, and not collaborate with each other at all in crafting the actual meat of what we turned in. Um, and so that was laid out by our instructor um, before. So we knew you know, what was allowed and what was not allowed. Um, but it can get really complicated. Um, and so that's why the the words of the otter code are sort of what they are. Um, but, you know, one of my main takeaways of this whole presentation is that I really encourage people to ask for clarification or specifics to the otter code if what's printed on the assignment or the syllabus is too vague or, you know, you have some lingering questions about okay, that makes sense on paper, but what does that actually look like in practice? So here's an example of, you know, a time when I might ask for more specifics. So I'm a first year, I'm doing an intro computer science course, and I'm about to start my first problem set. Um, I look at the syllabus to see what the collaboration policies are, and it says collaboration is encouraged, but all submitted work must be your own. Um, I can basically guarantee that most of you will have that sentence or a similar sentence written on one of your syllabi. So yeah, that's it. Um, and so here are some questions that I might ask of the professor. Um, okay, in practice, what is an example of collaboration that's gone too far? Um, with computer science, you know, the code is the code and especially with a lot of intro courses, um, there's like one right way to do it um, or, you know, a, a small set of right ways to do it. Um, so if I'm collaborating, which is encouraged, like, can we write the code together? Um, can we look at each other's computer screens? Do you want us to only speak in theoretical terms about ideas for what we might code? Um, so there's a lot of questions that I would sort of ask to clarify that there. Okay, so moving on to the actual makeup of the committee. Um, the committee is comprised of eight students. So we have two per class here. Um, and eight faculty members, and then one dean. Um, only the students vote, and the students are voted in by the student body, so it is truly a student government. Um, we hold honor hearings. We also hold disciplinary hearings, which are violations of the student code of conduct, um, but the bulk of the cases that we see are honor hearings. Um, and then we also, importantly, work with the college community on communicating and clarifying the honor code. So you'll hopefully see us around campus doing some of that. Um, here was the committee for 2022-2023. Um, poor Evan got half of his face cut off. Um, but uh, hopefully the website it is updated or will be updated in early September with the new committee. So you can see who's there um, and, you know, feel free to ask any of them questions. All right, one of the questions that I get a lot when I tell people that I'm on the committee is, well, what will happen if I'm accused of violating the honor code? What is the process like? Um, the short answer is really complicated and pretty boring, so I'm not gonna get into it too much because that's not one of the main takeaways of this uh, presentation. Um, it's on the website in great detail, um, so you can look there to find it. Um, but long story short, what happens is a professor or other student or TA will suspect someone of violating the honor code. They'll have evidence. They will take it to the committee. We will decide if we want to hear the case. Um, we'll hear the case. The professor will present their evidence. The student will then present their evidence. Um, and then the committee will deliberate um, and get back to both the student and the professor. Um, 
there also is a process for reconsideration or appeal. Um, and that is if new evidence has arisen after the hearing has been resolved or um, there was an allegation of improper procedure during the hearing itself. Um, again, all on the website, pretty boring, but if you're curious, it goes into great detail. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. Another question that I get all the time is like, well, if I did this, like what sanction would you give out for that? Um, the short answer is it's impossible to know. It depends on all sorts of things. Um, a lot of specifics of the case, no case is exactly the same. Um, it also depends on who's serving on the hearing because not everyone serves for every hearing because of scheduling. Um, but we do have yearly reports online on the honor code website. Um, so if you're curious, you can look through those. They give a brief description of what the case was with all identifying information removed um, and then what sanction the committee decided. You'll see variations from year to year, especially around the COVID time. Um, so if you're curious, uh, those are online. But in general, uh, it's safe to say that the severity of the sanction reflects the severity of the violation. Um, if the sources were cited poorly, maybe that could you know, warrant a warning in the educational tutorial, but if you, you know, copied your roommate's exam, that's a much more serious conversation. All right, so this section gets into some of the key takeaways that I want you guys to take away from this presentation. Um, no one's really coming into Williams thinking, oh, I plan on cheating. Oh, I think that, you know, this is something that I intend on doing. Um, but most of the instances of honor code violations, probably upwards of 90% happen in really high stress, really time pressured situations. Um, and this is due to all sorts of factors. The workload at Williams, it's no secret, it can be a lot, especially as a first year coming in, um, you're used to high school workloads, which can, you know, vary vastly from school to school. Um, and, you know, getting plunged headfirst into a college course load is pretty overwhelming sometimes. Um, obviously there's also stressors outside of the academic world. Um, you might have, you know, issues going on at home. Um, random sickness is a huge one. I get sick all the time. Here's me the week before finals with food poisoning. That was great. Um, and in those situations, it's frustrating because no matter, you know, really how much you plan ahead, you don't ever account for being bedridden for three days. Um, and so those can lead to those high stress and time pressure situations. Um, and then, you know, some cases are accidental and they're just a result of, you know, lack of knowledge about plagiarism or not understanding collaboration policies as they're written in the syllabus. And it's, again, really important that you ask for clarification about citation and collaboration policies because in the cases when you might be confused, um, there's still violations because you have signed the honor code um, before entering the school and you agree to abide by what your instructor puts in the syllabus and on the assignment. Um, so I thought that was important to mention. Um, basically, the next part of this presentation will be about how to avoid high stress and time pressure situations and if all else fails, uh, what to do when you find yourself in one of them, because you probably will be in a high stress time pressure situation before the end of your four years. If not, you have to let me know because I want to know how you did that. Um, all right, so how to avoid these situations. Um, obviously, the best thing to do is to anticipate them. Um, so use some sort of planning device, whether it's Google Calendar, a paper planner, or some other technique. Um, I use Notion personally, an app on my computer. Um, so this is my workload going into finals week, ironically, when I had the food poisoning. <laughs> Um, and so I have my task slash assignment here, the course it's for, um, the type of task, and then the date that it was due. Um, this works really, really well for me. Um, if you're curious about setting something like this up, you can email me and I can try and walk you through it because I, I really like it. Um, once you have everything sort of planned out, um, definitely request those extensions that you might need in advance of the busy times, or at least take note of the busy times and try to plan around them. So if you have three papers due on one day, um, you know, try and get one done maybe a week in advance and one, you know, half a week in advance, and then you can turn the last one in on the day it's due. Um, but there's no way you're going to be able to do three papers in one night unless you're some sort of 
crazy smart person. Um, and then stay on top of your work, obviously. Um, I think attending professor's office hours helps me personally a lot with this. Um, I can ask those questions that might not have been appropriate to ask in front of a lecture of 60 people. Um, and I've always found those office hour sessions to be really fruitful. Um, you can also talk to your class dean if you're struggling with time management strategies or academically in general. They're wonderful people. I know many of them from my work on this committee and I know Dean Walsh quite well and they're super kind and will love to talk to you about basically anything. So definitely reach out. And then um, a huge thing that helps me is taking care of my physical and mental well-being um, no matter what. So I'll you know get into this a little bit on the next slide with some fantastic pictures of myself once again. All right. <laughs> so I felt like this warranted its own slide. Um, I know that you all probably know this, but it's an important reminder going into Williams, it's really easy to get caught up in the workload. Um, and I always am reminding myself to prioritize, you know, my brain a little bit. So everyone does this differently, of course. I like to go on runs. Um, I also like to go visit this dog. This dog lives on Stetson Road. If you're going in the direction of Hopkins Forest, you'll pass a house with this white fence. And oftentimes that dog is outside. So I highly recommend. Um, also, I hugely, hugely recommend taking advantage of IWS, the Integrative Wellbeing Services at Williams. Um, and one thing that helps me again is taking me meaningful breaks. So I love to go outside. I love to call my grandma um, and I love to write letters and send them snail mail. All right, so now we have a hypothetical situation, totally not loosely based on real events whatsoever. Um, and in this situation, I have failed to manage my time or something came up or, you know, I'm, I'm in a high pressure time stressed situation. Um, so here's here's the scenario. It's 2 a.m. I have a paper on a Greek victory ode due tomorrow morning, and I've barely started it because my Latin translation took way longer than I thought. Um, so in my 2 a.m. brain, here are my options. I could get ChatGPT to write an essay on the ode and get some sleep. Um, I could frantically email my professor and beg for a last minute extension, which would be pretty embarrassing, and I would probably get denied the extension asking that late. Um, or I could do nothing, not turn in anything and provide no explanation. Um, a fourth option, which maybe I should have put on here is stay up, not sleep and write a probably pretty terrible essay and turn that in the next day. Okay, so I really, really encourage people in these situations to stop first and foremost, and then think. Um, so many violations could be avoided if people in the moment just like stopped for a second and actually thought about what they were about to do. Um, obviously, when you're stressed and panicked, like that's not something that your brain really wants to do. Um, but if you're in a situation like this, please just stop and think. Um, so here's hypothetical me at 2 a.m.'s thought process. Um, so the chat GPT option sounds kind of appealing, um, but when I stopped to think about it, thought about it, um, here's what I came up with. First of all, the professor would probably notice because she's read my work um, and knows when it sounds like me and when it sounds like Jack GPT. Um, really importantly, I should have bolded this. It kind of destroys the entire point of being here. Um, oftentimes when I'm really stressed and pressed for time, I sit down and I'm like, okay, I'm at Williams because I want to learn. I want to work with this material really closely. Um, and so I'm going to dedicate myself to this next assignment a lot because the more I put into it, the more I get out of it. Um, and so I think asking yourself, like, why am I here is really important. Um, also, I'd be putting my own integrity on the line, but also the school's integrity and the integrity of the academic community. Plus the poet Pindar who died in like 500 BCE would be rolling around in his dusty grave somewhere in Greece. Um, and then I would also really be eroding the professor's trust in me. Um, I think that's a really big one. These professors want you to succeed. They want to work with you. They're invested in you and your academic journey. Um, and to disrespect them by turning in work that's not your own and claiming it as your own is 
really breaking that bond of trust that they have with you from the get-go. So I hope in these situations, those are the things you sort of think about. Um, instead, I should, you know, to am me, should realize that cheating is not the best idea. Um, explain my situation to my prof professor, maybe face-to-face -face and not, you know, a frantic email at three in the morning. Um, I would not recommend staying up and pulling an all-nighter and finishing a paper that's not your best work. Your professor wants you to sleep. You want to sleep. Um, it's not going to be fun the next few days <laughs> dealing with the repercussions of that. Um, so what I would do in this situation is I would um, ask my professor the next day if I can submit the paper late for partial credit. Um, and then obviously in the future, adjusting my time management techniques and talking to my dean. Um, so that's my hypothetical situation. <laughs> but again, a lot of this can be avoided by, you know, being one step ahead of your work. Um, you know, if I had done that Latin assignment a day early, then even though it took me longer than I thought, I might have the time to give the paper the attention that it deserves. All right. And the last of my takeaways is, again, to pay attention to the syllabi, um, read the honor code sections. Um, most people, there's some classes you have to sign them. Don't just sign without reading what you're signing. Um, ask yourself if anything is unclear or if there's vagueness in the language. Um, think about whether you foresee any confusions about what the honor code says, especially in classes that really encourage collaboration. Um, and then go to your professor and ask them about these things. Um, they would much rather get a ton of questions about the honor code than no questions and, you know, have people be breaking the honor code, um, in their class. And then finally, of course, take care of yourself. Um, Williams is not all about work all the time. You have to give yourself breaks or else you'll go insane. Um, and for me, finding that balance between self-care and getting my work done um, has made me more productive in the long run and kept me out of these high pressure situations um, as best as possible, I think. So here is a great list of resources. Hopefully I can get some live links below via the magic of the Dean's office. Um, so the honor code website, which was linked in slide four should be here again. Um, there's also the writing workshop, um, which is a super great resource. Um, they've got a great website and they have offices in Chapin library. Um, and you can go to their office at any point in the writing process. Even if you just have an outline, a big idea of what your paper should be, um, you can go to them for help and for the purposes of the honor presentation, they're great resources on citation and, um, plagiarism. So they, they all know what they're doing in that respect. They have a great web page on plagiarism. Um, and then the Williams library has a really great page on how to cite your sources. Um, and I know the research librarians at, um, both libraries will be more than happy to help you guys out with anything research or. Uh, citation related. Um, of course, talk to your professors and your deans um, really about anything. Um, they're happy to answer questions about anything that you're curious about. Um, and then again, really utilizing the student health and wellness services that we have access to here. Um, they're really great. And I think that they're overlooked sometimes. So I really encourage you to check those out if you think that they would be helpful for you. And then final note, running for the committee, um, we do need two first-year representatives to join us. So those elections are run by a group called Table. Um, look out for an email from them. They should, it will be a big email about all sorts of committees and different things you can sit on and honor disciplinary committee will be included in there. Um, you have to do a quick self, you have to nominate yourself and then sort of write a 100 to 300 word, um, that was the cat uh statement on you know why you think you'd be a good fit and then the students in your class here will vote um again if you have any questions about any of that reach out to me um questions about what life on the committee is like um i'm more than happy to answer those all right thank you guys so much for sticking with me through that again please contact me with any questions that you have about the committee or anything else you're curious about at williams um particularly classics geosciences or williams mystic program um, I can't wait to see you guys around and I hope that you have a great rest of your summer. Bye.